air and identify the key role that uh, GPs have in assessing and managing uh, suicide, prevent suicide risk in young people in primary care. These are some of the collaborators that we work across um, universities uh, and also professional organizations such as the Royal College of, uh, of GPs. So what we know so far, we know that suicide and in particular youth suicide is, is a global public health concern. Um, despite the significant differences in age, country, uh, gender and rates of, in, in rates of suicide, we know that young people are a key focus of suicide prevention and intervention efforts uh, worldwide, with a particular of, um, focus on, on late adolescents. Um, suicide is the fourth leading cause of death among 15 to 19 year olds. Uh, Self-harm is among the strongest risk factors for suicide, and I don't want to preempt uh, Galid and Keith's uh, presentation, uh, but, we, but although not everybody who self-harms will uh, make an attempt, we know that repeated self-harm over a long period of time is a significant risk factor for suicide, particularly increasing suicide risk by 50 times. Uh, suicide is complex, is, is rarely the outcome of, uh, of a single factor. And as you, uh, as you can see from this diagram with data supported from the National Confidential Inquiry, um, focusing on children and young people report in 2017, you can see that although we have one event that may act as a final straw, this is predated by background of vulnerability, uh, many stressors acting uh, cumulatively, um, starting from early life experiences. Um, among the many stressors that increase uh, suicide risk and increase vulnerability uh, to suicide, uh, we know that social risk factors, uh, bullying, um, academic pressures, uh, social isolation and, 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 and poverty. And because of um, because of, oh, I'm sorry. Um, and because the, many of the determinants of uh, suicide lie at the heart of, of social adversity, there is a real need for a shared role and responsibility uh, between health and social care, education, uh, justice system, the voluntary sector, uh, when it comes to uh, suicide prevention and intervention efforts. Within this multifaceted uh, public health approach to suicide, primary care and in particular general practice plays a key uh, role. Uh, we've got evidence um, spanning now two decades now about the important role that GPs have in assessing and managing um, um, stress and, and mental health problems within primary care. We know that GPs are the first uh, point of contact from people in distress. Uh, we know that approximately 60% of young people who have self-harmed have seen their GP in the past um, six months. Uh, we've seen a rise in self-harm presentations by young people to general practice. Uh, and we also know that among the 16 to 25 year olds who self-harm, uh, they see their GP the most um, compared to other health professionals in the NHS. Um, on your right, you'll see the NHL digital survey from 2017, looking at mental health and well-being of children and young people in, in England. Um, and what you can see is that primary care sits quite prominently when it comes to help sitting after teachers, help sitting for mental health concerns. Um, so the questions that we have been asking over the past, uh, since I think 2014, when we started this program of work, is what are the challenges that GPs face in managing suicide risk among young people in primary care? Uh, what are the challenges that young people face when seeking help from a GP? And how can we work collaboratively both with GPs and young people to address those challenges and develop resources and tools uh, that can support uh, both GPs and young people when it comes to uh, suicide prevention in primary care. You can see here some of the work that we have published over the years. 
So um, our work started, as I said, back in 2014, when we were commissioned by Nottingham City Clinic and Commissioning Group, uh, the, the primary study to look at um, knowledge um, of GPs when it comes to risk factors and warning signs of suicide, attitudes and training preferences. So we carried out a survey, then we unpacked the findings of the survey uh, in, in focus groups where we explored GPs' views and experiences of assessing, managing and communicating with young people in, in primary care. Um, we were in, then we were commissioned by the East Midlands Patient Safety Collaborative mm -hmm. to repeat the survey, a cross-sectional survey. Uh, assessing levels of confidence, clinical skills, competence, and attitudes towards suicide prevention using well-validated uh, scales such as the STORM and the SERI. And what I have tried to do in this diagram is to uh, highlight some of the key findings of these different strands of, of, of work um, and uh, highlight some of the key challenges that G uh, GPs face when it comes to assessing and managing um, young people who might be at risk of suicide in primary care. Organizational barriers uh, um, feature quite prominently there. GPs have talked about time-limited consultations, uh, increased workload, um, problematic referral pathways with uh, specialist uh, services, uh, patient-related barriers. What GPs have identified in our research is that although uh, suicide is a, a, a concern when it comes to, to primary care, um, they identified specific difficulties when it comes to assessing and managing young people over and above any other um, age groups. Um, for example, uh, one of the key things that they've mentioned in focus groups is how do we identify when someone is uh, at risk? All we see in consultations is a snapshot, snapshot of a young person's life. Um, lack of resources was also something that they have uh, mentioned, and this was linked to lack of uh, specialist education and training on suicide prevention. Um, approximately 60% of the GPs who have taken part in our research had not received any suicide prevention training um, in the past five years from when the research took place. Um, so what they have identified is the need for educational resources or tools which need to be very brief and simple, uh, grounded in the realities of general practice that, uh, that can support a, a general practitioner when it comes to uh, supporting young people uh, at risk of suicide in primary care. In response to these uh, challenges, we have worked uh, closely with the Royal College of General Practitioners. Um, we were commissioned by the Royal College of General Practitioners to develop a, a educational resource, an online educational resource for, for GPs, uh, what we call Suicide in Children and Young People, the top tips. This sits under the um, uh, mental health toolkit on the Royal College of GPs website. It is open access, and if you scan the QR code, it will take you straight to the um, uh, to the leaflet. So this we worked with GPs, um, both academic GPs and clinical advisors within the Royal College of GPs to develop um, this educational resource. Um, it, was, it features within the recent report that was um, published by the Samaritans and the Center for Mental Health on strengthening the front line and investing uh, in, in, in primary care. Uh, and it's split into three sections. Uh, in the first section, we provide evidence of some of the well-documented risk factors for suicide in children and young people. Uh, then we have 10 suggestions, uh, what we call top tips. Uh, to support GPs uh, when they're in a consultation with the young people who might be at risk of suicide. And then we provide a number of resources for GPs, both for their own use and also to signpost young people and uh, family members. So what I will do now, I'll present some of the tips that GPs said are particularly relevant for them and the ones that might be uh, more of, uh, sort of concern for them. And although this educational resource was uh, developed and co-designed with GPs uh, with primary care in mind, I think what you will find is many of the tips that we have here are transferable to other settings. Um, confidentiality uh, is the first one, and we know that this is a big concern for young people. 
uh, and could impede and could uh, be a significant barrier to help seeking. But also a concern by, from GPs um, when it comes to the impact, the potential impact that a breach of confidentiality can have on building a trusting and therapeutic relationship with a young person. So what we have highlighted in the uh, resource is the need to explain confidentiality and its limits clearly and as early as possible in, uh, in the consultation. Um, it, uh, being clear with the young person about uh, why um, there, is, there might be a need for breaching confidentiality, uh, what information will be shared and uh, with whom and how and keeping the young person informed and involved. The second is around uh, asking about suicidal ideation uh, directly. Uh, and what we have tried to highlight within this educational resource is some myths that exist about talking about suicide and self-harm uh, and how we can work with GPs and young people to bust some of those myths. So, um, for example, one of the things that we have highlighted is that Talking about suicide and self-harm does not, there is no evidence to suggest that it could increase risk or it could uh, cause harm or it could put ideas into young people's uh, heads. In fact, research that we have carried out with young people, which I will show you um, further down the, the line, uh, identifies that young people do appreciate being asked openly uh, about suicide. And the third one is about safety planning and how uh, GPs can work collaboratively with young people to develop a safety plan. Essentially, what this comes down to is how can we keep this young person alive, as one of the GPs have put it. And, and again, we have written a blog um, for the uh, British General, of, um, General Practice Life and Times, and this QR code will take you straight there about how, um, about the, how, how GPs can work collaboratively with the young people to co-produce a safety plan. Safety planning is, is a brief and, and quick um, intervention uh, of where we identify warning signs with the young person, internal coping strategies, uh, professional support and people in settings that can provide distraction uh, in order to keep the young person um, uh, safe. So, five key questions that we have taken from our, um, our Brown and Stanley's um, template, which I'll show you in, in a minute, is working with a young person to identify some of the warning signs. So what are those signs, such as stressful situations or distressing thoughts and feelings that might trigger your suicidal thoughts? And writing these down using the young person's own words. What are some of the things you can do to distract yourself when having suicidal thoughts? Uh, who would you turn to, for example, a friend or a family, or where would you go to for help when feeling suicidal? So identifying key people and social settings that can provide distraction and support uh, when uh, you're in, 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 you in distress or a suicidal crisis. Uh, which professionals or agencies uh, can you contact when feeling suicidal? And actually writing down specific um, names and, and phone numbers. And what things uh, such as such, uh, sharp objects and medication can we remove or limit access to in order to keep you safe? Essentially, how can we make the environment safe? Um, some practical tips about co-creating a, a safety plan is the plan needs to be uh, personalized uh, and specific to the young person's needs. So one of the things that we advise GPs is not to paraphrase uh, what the young person has said, but to use the, their own words, uh, to keep it brief and, and, and simple, um, to work with the young person to identify what is important to them in life and worth living for, and, and then giving the young person a copy to take with them. Although there are no hard and fast rules about how to carry out a safety plan. One of the uh, safety uh, plan templates that uh, we do tend to use in clinical practice is the one by Brown and Stahl, which of uh, Stanley and Brown, which I have um, included uh, here. 
So um, what I have provided so far is a snapshot of the work that we have done with GPs, which has been very important and instrumental in providing uh, the context so that, we can, so that we can understand now young people's experiences of uh, seeking help from, um, from a GP when feeling suicidal. Uh, and what I'll present to you now is a piece of work that we have carried out uh, in collaboration with, in, in partnership with the Youth Advisory Group at the Institute for Mental Health. Uh, the Youth Advisory Group is a group of young people aged 16 to 25 with living and lived experience of mental ill health, uh, including self-harm and suicidal experiences. And we have worked collaboratively with the group over the past two years to identify research priorities in the area. Uh, for example, exploring the processes involved in help seeking from a GP that I'll show you in a minute. And then how we use the findings of this research to develop uh, um, an important resource, My GP Guide, uh, preparing young people for their GP consultation. And now how we work collaboratively in partnership with uh, young people to disseminate the guide as widely as possible. Um, so we have, uh, as I mentioned, in terms of, of, of research, one of the key priorities identified by the youth advisory group by young people is to understand and conceptualize the processes that underline uh, young people's help seeking um, prior, during and following a consultation with the understanding that help seeking is a, is a non going and, and dynamic process. So we have worked with the youth advisory group to identify the aims of the study. Uh, we have chosen to explore this in a, through a qualitative research study because of the exploratory nature of this research. We have worked closely with the young people to identify, to develop and co-design the topic guide, which focuses around exploring uh, how, when and why young people seek help from their GP when feeling suicidal. And young people have helped us review the findings of the study. Uh, and what I will show you now is a quick snapshot of the work that we have done. We interviewed through in-depth interviews with eight young people aged 16 to 25. Uh, they were all under the care of a youth mental health service in Birmingham, and they all had a history of attempted suicide in the past three years. Uh, the study is reported in line with the correct guidelines, and we used framework analysis. And through the data analysis, what we have identified is three overarching themes. Um, one is understanding when to seek help from, uh, from a GP. So young people talked about the processes of seeking help and how uh, this process starts with when, uh, how, and uh, why young people first consider uh, seeking help. One of the things that they have highlighted in this theme with is illustrated through the sub themes is difficulty with understanding and articulating distress. So young people have said uh, in this study that they knew that something was not quite right. Uh, however, they could not articulate their distress. They couldn't find the right words to express how they felt. Uh, and one of the reasons that prevented them from seeking help from a GP is the fear that they would, um, is, is the fear that by not being able to articulate the stress, they would inevitably sort of trivialize how they feel. Preconceptions of GP's role was something that um, we were not surprised, but because again, it's, it's a recurring issue. Um, one of the quotes by one of our young people said that, I found myself in a, in a, in a waiting room uh, with a group of people with other patients waiting to be seen and they were all coughing and sneezing, and I found myself wondering, why am I here? Young people talked about barriers and facilitating factors at a GP consultation. So those factors that both hindered and also facilitated disclosure and asking for help and support. And we were quite surprised by the findings of these, because although we expected that uh, young people would raise issues such as um, you know, very time limited consultations or long waiting times, actually what young people's narratives focused was on the interpersonal aspects of the consultation um, and how, uh, how GPs communicated with them. Uh, empathy, compassion, sort of clear communication, and those clinical skills that are very important, which young people found that they can make or break a consultation.
and impact on future help seeking. And lastly, young people talked about help seeking as a non-linear and dynamic process. It's a, they described uh, seeking help as a sort of a very complex and multifaceted process influenced by many uh, different factors, which I've tried to encapsulate here, both uh, prior, during, and after a GP consultation. For example, during a GP consultation, what young people spoke about is the importance of feeling safe uh, and supported to disclose the stress, uh, confidence uh, in GP's knowledge and skills to, to support them, and also how validated they felt uh, through, this, uh, through the consultation. And many other things, as you can see here, uh, for example, you know, prior GP experience and availability of alternative support networks. So these are a number of sort of separate yet interrelated processes that impact on young people's help seeking. So the next step that uh, what we brought uh, to young people is what, what do we do? What do we do with the findings of this uh, study? Uh, because, because young people do not read academic papers, uh, and one of the things that became apparent very, very clear and was raised by the youth advisory group was that there are some important implications uh, here uh, resulting from this study that we can use. So we have worked uh, with uh, the young, uh, young people over a period of six to eight months. It was during lockdown, so uh, all the consultations that we have carried out were carried out online. Uh, bringing together the findings of this study and other studies, and also the findings from the consultation that we carried out with the youth advisory group to co-produce uh, my GP guide. So this is a guide uh, by young people for young people with lived experience of self-harm and, um, and suicide. Um, and what it does, it aims to provide help young people prepare to talk with their GP about self-harm and suicidal experiences. Um, trying to alleviate some of the concerns that uh, young people might have in preparation for their GP consultation. And also providing some relevant resources for young people and signposting them. We worked with a um, creative digital uh, consultant in order to develop and sort of co-design uh, the guide. And as you can see, young people's voices through these quotes, uh, we've made sure that it, they shine through the, 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 this guide, their involvement in their partnership. Uh, just a snapshot of some of the things that we have included in the guide. For example, before you visit your GP, a lot of people have said that it, young people have said that it can be quite frightening. Uh, and sometimes when you're under pressure, you might find it very difficult to describe how, uh, how you feel. So making a list, for example, and preparing, um, and writing down some of the things that you would like to raise in a consultation is something that uh, young people find uh, helpful. Um, confidentiality, again, a very big concern. Um, as you can see here, a quote from Kaylin, very big concern for young people and can impact on, on help seeking and disclosure. So what we have provided is um, some advice about young people about what confidentiality is uh, and its limits, when it would need to be breached and how and, and why. So the young people are uh, informed and they know what to expect. During your GP consultation, again, one of the things that um, it was very important for young people to uh, include is, is safety planning. Uh, you can see here a quote from Lizzie, which says, sometimes I felt so lost in my emotions that I struggled to know what to do. Uh, making a safety plan with my doctor really helped me to navigate times like this. I stuck it on my bedroom wall and took a picture of it on my phone. So whenever I went, I could use some of the strategies on there. It was really helpful and not something I could have done on my own. So the next step is that uh, so it's, it's, it's a, this guide, which we're very proud about, is it is 20 pages. So, and I think it's highly unlikely that a young person would sit down and read a 20 page guide. So what we have worked with uh, young people is to bring, uh, how do we bring this guide to, to life? Uh, so we have worked again in partnership with a youth advisory group uh, and a digital consultant in order to develop a, a video, a very short video, uh, that brings the guide to, to life. Uh, 
Uh, the video includes the quotes uh, by young people using the young people's voices, so they've recorded their own quotes. Uh, and if I can ask now whether we can show this uh, video, I'll stop sharing the screen. Self-harm is when someone hurts themselves deliberately. This could include cutting, poisoning and burning. Self-harm is common among young people. Although young people who self-harm do not always do this because they want to end their life, repeated self-harm over a long period could be a sign that a young person might be thinking about suicide. We know that many young people find it very difficult to find the right words to describe how they feel. Visiting your general practitioner to talk about self-harm and suicidal feelings can be very frightening. This is because you might not know what to expect. You might feel anxious or embarrassed, or you might even be wondering whether a GP can help with these experiences. Visiting your GP is the first step towards getting the support you need and deserve. Visiting your GP to talk about self-harm and suicidal experiences can be very frightening. When you feel under pressure, you might find it difficult to describe how you feel and why you feel like that. You can write down a list of concerns, problems or questions you have before your appointment, as well as what kind of help and support you want from your GP. Booking an appointment is one of the first steps, but it is a scary step to have to take. It is important to find your voice and do what is comfortable for you. You only need to discuss what is comfortable, however it will be helpful to go into as much detail as possible. You can do this. Whether this is the first time you're visiting your GP or not, talking about self-harm and suicidal feelings can be difficult. You can bring a trusted friend, a family member or anyone who can support you with you to the appointment. They can sit in the waiting area or they can join you in the appointment. It is important to know that what you say to your GP is confidential. However, there might be cases where your GP has to share information with other professionals for example, when they are trying to get you the best help you need. Another example is when your GP thinks you might be at risk of death or serious harm. If your GP has to share information about you, they will ask for your consent first and they will tell you what information exactly they will share, with whom and why. You have to be mindful, however, that your GP might still have to share information about you without your consent. Although this might be upsetting, please remember that your GP has your best interest at heart and they want to do the right thing to keep you safe. If a doctor has to disclose information about you to your family, it can be terrifying and incredibly frustrating. It sucks and unfortunately that feeling does not go away but it is important to remember that this is one step closer to getting better. It is the beginning of the light at the end of the tunnel, as cheesy as that sounds. What your GP might ask. How do you self-harm and where? How often do you self-harm? What goes through your mind before you self-harm? Are you thinking about ending your life? Have you made any plans? How is your sleep, appetite and mood? Do you have a support network including family, friends or peers you can turn to when things get bad? What helps you cope with stressful events? Great. So what we wanted to um, show you here is a snapshot of um, of the guide uh, and how we've uh, tried to you know, 
make it those 20 pages more engaging for, for young people. Uh, so what we are in the process of doing now is sort of wider dissemination, try to reach as many uh, stakeholders are as possible, um, young people, uh, primary care practitioners, not just GPs, uh, allied health professionals, uh, family members and carers, and those working with closely with young people, such as youth workers and those in the voluntary sector. We've already carried out a panel discussion last um, month uh, with our youth participation lead, Naya, Lizzie and, and Charlie, two of the young people that were heavily involved in the co-design of the, of the guide. Um, uh, I did a podcast with, uh, with Lizzie as well. We've written a blog about it. We are now preparing a second um, panel discussion with uh, GPs. Uh, and family members, uh, family member bereaved by suicide to highlight the important role of uh, GPs in, uh, uh, in, in suicide prevention. And um, what I wanted to finish now to uh, wrapping up is, is the importance, and I hope, I hope I've highlighted the importance of, of meaningful uh, youth partnership and involvement when it comes to suicide prevention research and, uh, and implementation. Uh, and although uh, meaningful involving young people can have its challenges, um, there are many ways that we can do it in a way that it's um, safe, uh, feasible and, and, and acceptable. So our co-production was informed by key principles of youth partnership and involvement uh, developed and designed by ORIGIN, the National Centre of Excellence in, in Youth Mental Health in Australia. Uh, we have a youth uh, participation lead, Naya, you can see him here on the right corner, uh, who helped navigate this, sure that it was done in a way that it's feasible and ethical. Um, and a big thank you to our youth advisory group members who have been involved from the outset and continue to be involved uh, in the dissemination of, of, uh, of the guide. Uh, I would also like to thank you, Naya Campbell, for facilitating the youth advisory group uh, and my very good colleague, Anna Levis, for reviewing earlier drafts of this um, guide. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Maria. For some reason, Maria, we can't see you. I wonder if you could um, just check. I, yes, I, I press on start video, but it says that I cannot start the video. Um, okay, I, I, Anya will have, have, have a look at that and see if we have okay. uh, something we can change in, in the background settings. Yes. Um, these things always seem to happen after, consider yes. you perfectly earlier on. Okay. Oh, I do apologize. <laughs> Uh, no, no problem. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. So could I just, um, and thank you for the, the, your, your perfect timing on that. We have just a few minutes for questions, if anybody would like to put a question into the, the Q&A box. Um, I suppose I'd like to, to start by asking you about the um, engagement with the young people, because that seems to have been such an amazingly positive feature of your um, mm -hmm. of your work. Um, and I work with uh, Pieta, which is um, an organization in Ireland that um, offers support to uh, people who self harm or uh, who, are, who are suicidal. Mm -hmm. There's been some concern there about engaging with young people in particular around services and around um, support i'm just wondering how you went about ensuring that you were able to do this in a yes. in a safe and supportive way for the young people yes thank you thank you um Aish. and i absolutely it is it is it is a concern um so our youth advisory group so one of the things that we have invested heavily in the institute for mental health is um is a youth participation lead uh, so a dedicated person that can help uh, is involved in the recruitment of young people, uh, facilitating the process of um, their involvement in, in research and impact activities. Uh, one of the things that we've done from the outset is to develop a youth participation and partnership involvement strategy, which was heavily involved, uh, which was heavily influenced by young people's uh, insights. We have worked very closely with uh, youth participation leads in, across the world, and in particularly uh, Origin. Uh, and a big thank you to Magenta Simmons, 
Um, it's something that they um, excel at, they are pioneers in this, uh, in, in this aspect. And our approach is heavily influenced by the key principles of youth partnership and involvement um, developed and designed by, uh, by Origin. So we've got very clear strategies and safeguarding processes that uh, ensures that the involvement of young people is done in a way that it's ethical and, and, and feasible. Um, for example, our consultations, one of the things that I have uh, tried to do uh, within with this project is to ensure flexibility and, and, and creativity. Uh, so and really accommodating young people's needs and preferences about how they would like to be involved in this process, uh, in which ways, um, for example, uh, we've done uh, our consultations were carried out remotely. Some people were comfortable in contributing verbally. Others would use the chat function. Uh, we've used online whiteboards for young people who felt more uh, comfortable in sharing uh, their views uh, in, in, in writing. And other, people, and other young people would email me afterwards to, to share their insights. Um, not all young people are involved in all facets of this work. For example, there might be young people who are more confident, uh, such as Lizzie and, and, and Charlie, in, in um, being involved in uh, outreach and dissemination and public engagement activities, whereas there are other young people who feel more confident in being in the background. Uh, and again, one of the things that we have tried to do is be as flexible as possible uh, in order to facilitate their involvement and as creative as possible. Um, is it always easy? Uh, no. Uh, is it doable? Absolutely, yes. I think there needs to be sort of shared expectations and be very clear and transparent with young people from the outset about what their par participation will involve, um, including uh, time management, because we know that as, uh, as academics and researchers, uh, you know, our time so deadlines and, and time management is very different to a young person. And also acknowledging the fact that um, young people are involved in the youth advisory groups are also have um, are also students hold part time jobs. Uh, uh, so acknowledging the fact the multiple roles and identities that might have uh, and, and respecting that in that process. OK, th thanks, Maria. That's 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 really good to know. And, and did was it always one to one um, work with the young people? No, it was a group based. Uh, oh, group based. Group based. Okay, okay. Sorry. So the youth advisory group, we've got about two, 18 young people. Not all of them were involved. Uh, what we usually do is send an expression of interest. Uh, and we try to uh, match um, young people based on, on their preferences, on the interest that they show. So it was a subgroup of the youth advisory group of approximately six to seven young people. Uh, they were all involved in the design of the guide and the content, the development of the content. And a subgroup of them are now involved in the dissemination and impact activities. Okay, th thanks, Maria. Could I could I ask you? Um, we've had one uh, question come in in our Q and A function, and please remember, um, if if anyone else would like to ask a question, you can use the Q and A function. I think this may be a phrase that you used: uh, suicidal crisis. Um, mm -hmm. Your um, could you give the give us a, a, a definition of how of what your view of a suicidal crisis is? So I think I mentioned that in relation to the safety, uh, so the, the safety uh, planning. So uh, when young people start feeling uh, distressed, when there might be signs there that something is not quite uh, right, uh, experiencing of suicidal thoughts. Uh, and this is how young people uh, described being in a suicidal crisis. Uh, and this was in response to having a safety plan when you are in this suicidal crisis, when you are might be in, in a way distressed and thinking about suicide, where things might be getting on top of you. A lot of young people describe the claustrophobic sense of um, not seeing a way out, uh, feelings of hopelessness and, and helplessness. Uh, and then in relation to safety planning, having something there, uh, some simple strategies and uh, people that they can contact to or places that they can go to keep safe when they are in crisis. Okay, the question. Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, say, I, I, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> 
I hope I hope so. I hope I hope so too. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. So, um, it, unless we have any other uh, questions, I think um, we might uh, leave it there. I just give people one more minute to add any other questions they would like to ask to the Q&A function. And if not, we'll take a, a few minutes break and return at uh, 10.30 with our um, next presentation by Dr. Galit uh, Gulioff and Professor Keith Houghton. Okay, so listen, Maria, thank you so much um, for that thank really you. interesting presentation, and in particular for sharing all those resources. I think they will be very widely shared and used, and I'm particularly um, happy that they can be shared with an Irish audience here today who may not have um, who may not have been aware of it uh, beforehand. So uh, thanks again, Maria. And, and sorry, thank I'm you. not sure what has gone on that we, we can't see you. We, we That's were okay. We're here on this morning. <laughs> thank, thank, you. thank you so much. So just to say, everybody, uh, please stay with us. Uh, the next presentation will start at uh, 10.30 as, uh, as scheduled. Maria?